As you already saw in the previous episodes of this series, nutrition researchers have determined the energy value of food and drinks by burning various foodstuffs in a calorimeter and measuring the difference in water's temperature. While the energy expenditure of the human body was calculated based on the assumption that when the food is consumed in the body it must yield the same quantity of energy as when burned in the calorimeter, in both cases, it is burned with oxygen, although the process in the body is far less simple than in the calorimeter. However, raising the temperature of a known amount of water depends on the atmospheric pressure and the starting temperature. Thus, when scientists tried to determine the electrical energy required to calibrate the modern calorimeters, they encountered different values. For raising the temperature of water from 0 to 1 degrees Celsius at standard atmospheric pressure, the energy measured was 4.184 joules, a value known as the thermochemical calorie or the 0 degrees calorie. For warming up 1 gram of water from 3.5 to 4.5 degrees Celsius, also at standard atmospheric pressure, the energy required was 4.204 joules, so scientists coined the 4 degrees calorie. At 15 degrees Celsius, they encountered a degree of uncertainty, the electrical energy ranging from 4.1852 joules to 4.1858 joules, so the International Standards Organization set a standard value for the 15 degrees calorie to 4.1855 joules. From 19.5 to 20.5 degrees Celsius, same standard atmospheric pressure, scientists ended up with another calorie, known as the 20 degrees calorie, equal to 4.1819 joules. Besides these calories, scientists defined the mean calorie as one hundredth of the amount of energy required to warm one gram of air-free water from zero to 100 degrees Celsius, equal to 4.19002 joules, and the international steam table calorie, equal to 4.1868 joules. As a result, in 1948, at the Ninth General Conference on Weight and Measures, scientists adopted the joule as the unit for energy and the 15 degrees calorie as the unit for heat, while in 1960, the calorie was permanently replaced by the joule, the latter being defined as the official unit for work, energy, and heat. In 1966, the Joint Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations and the World Health Organization Expert Committee on Nutrition considered the implications of substituting calories for joules. The experts argued that the calorie as used in nutritional science has been defined in different ways which lends to confusion, whereas the jewel corresponds with the energy measurements in all branches of science on which the nutritional sciences depend. Because of this, efforts to retain the calorie as the unit of energy will tend to isolate the nutritional sciences from the advances in the fields of physics and chemistry. In 1969, the Committee on Nomenclature of the International Union of Nutritional Sciences required an exact figure of 4.1840 joules for one calorie for those engaged in the research on energy exchange involving calorimetry, while nutritionists and dietitians, who are basically the specialists involved in public education concerning energy balance, were allowed to use a less accurate ratio of 4.19 or even 4.2 kilojoules per kilocalorie. Although the difference between these two values might seem insignificant, please keep in mind that when we're referring to the energy requirements of the human body, we're talking about millions of calories, namely 2,250,000 calories per day for a fasting individual, as determined by the father of modern dietetics, Carl von Voigt, or 6,260,000 calories per day for a person who's pedaling a medical bicycle for eight hours a day as calculated by the father of modern nutrition research and education, Wilbur Olin Atwater. Starting in the 1970s, most of the countries that have adopted the International System of Measurement, or, for short, the SI, began the transition from calories to joules. In the USA, although the grams and milligrams are used in many public and scientific domains, including to express the amounts of vitamins and macronutrients on the food labels, the values found on medical prescriptions, over-the-counter drugs, blood pressure, or cholesterol levels, in nutrition, the conversion from the obsolete calorie to joule did not begin not even after more than a half century. So, let's try to figure out how much energy we get from the food and drinks we consume by understanding first the joule. In the SI, the joule is defined as the work done when the point of application of one unit of force in the meter-kilogram-second system moves a distance of one meter in the direction of the force, whereas one unit of force in the same MKS system 
represents the force which gives to a mass of 1 kilogram an acceleration of 1 meter per second, per second. I'm fully aware that, for most of you, these definitions sound extremely complicated, so let's try to understand them with some practical examples. Let's suppose you're holding your palm facing up, and you place an object in your hand. You'll notice that the object will push down your palm, because of its weight. If the object weighs about 100 grams, we'd say that the object exerts upon your palm a force equal to approximately 1 newton. I say about 100 grams and approximately 1 newton, because in physics, things are a little more complicated, and, for an object to exert on a surface a force of exactly 1 newton, considering Earth's gravity equal to 9.80665 meters per second squared, the object's mass, expressed in kilograms, would have to be exactly 0.101, followed by another 11 decimals. But, for the sake of simplification, and for you to understand what's the deal with the joule, we'll round down the mass of the object to 0.1 kilograms, meaning 100 grams. If you place any object, it can be a medium-sized apple, two regular chocolate bars, or any other item, weighing 100 grams, on any surface, on a table, on a shelf, or the floor, that object will exert on that surface a force of approximately 1 newton. As you probably realize, 1 newton of force is very small, so that's why force is usually expressed in kilonewton, meaning 1000 newtons, or meganewton, meaning 1000 kilonewtons. Now, let's suppose that our item, weighing 100 grams, is on a table, and you pick it up. When the item reaches a distance of exactly 1 meter of the table, the action of lifting required 1 joule of energy. Of course, lifting 100 grams to a distance of 1 meter isn't such a big deal, and that's why energy is usually expressed in kilojoules, meaning 1,000 joules. In other words, when you see on a 330 milliliter can of Coca-Cola that it has an energy content of 627 kilojoules, it means that the soda from that can gives you enough energy to lift an object weighing 627 kilograms to a distance of 1 meter. Or, after you eat a whole bag of potato chips, you'd have enough energy to lift over 2,000 kilograms to a distance of 1 meter, and you can apply this simple conversion to any food or drink you want. I know it might sound a lot, but, despite what many people believe, the truth is that the human body needs, and uses, tremendous amounts of energy. If you remember from the first episode of this series, the energy used by a 71-kilogram male, who, during 24 hours, wasn't allowed to eat any solid food and drank only about one liter of water, was so huge that he could have raised with one degree Celsius the temperature of the water from a swimming pool, measuring approximately 50 meters long by 22 meters wide and 2 meters deep. However, not all the energy coming from the food and drinks we consume is converted into mechanical energy exerted by the muscles. Yet, before we figure out how energy is used in the human body, let's understand what's the deal with carbohydrates and what are the causes of the modern epidemic of obesity and diabetes.